So take your Bible, if you will, and uh, let me get my Bible. And I'd like you to turn to Proverbs chapter 24, Proverbs chapter 24. Now I know it's about, um, well, it's about 20 till, about, it's more like 17 till, but anyway, who's counting, right? But I'll preach fast if you'll listen fast. I have a truth I believe I want to share. I want to share with you a truth I preached before, never here. I preached this message uh, probably about 12, 14 years ago to a group of pastors. And so I want you to bear in mind it deals with pastors and ministry. But it's so applicable to anyone who's involved in any type ministry. It's also applicable for anyone who would be in business, uh, anyone who'd be raising a household, anyone who would be involved in anything uh, that's growing. Pastors have a, a calling not just to um, preach, because we're all ordained to be preachers of the word. Go ye therefore and preach the gospel to every creature. Pastors are called to lead a congregation in obedience to the word of God, they're to reach out, they're to use that congregation to the best of their skills and ability, to use that church to reach throughout its area to reap a harvest for the Lord Jesus Christ. Our goal is to reach people for Christ. That's why we're here. After we reach them, our job is to teach them. So that's the teaching arm of the ministry. So pretty much the reaching arm of the ministry is Monday through Saturday. The teaching arm of the ministry is Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, different times we gather together. Discipleship classes that we have throughout the week, that's the teaching arm of the ministry. But reaching should be in a constant endeavor, reaching people for Christ, reaching people to Christ. Now we have planned outreaches at different times throughout the week. Uh, on Tuesday, there's men's jail services. On Wednesday, there's teenagers going out sharing their faith and seeing many people come to faith in Christ. And then on Thursday, the adults go out and teenagers go out. And then on Fridays, we have our RU. And then on Saturdays, we have our bus routes going out, seeing many people come to faith in Christ. And then, of course, on Sunday afternoon, we have our ladies' jail ministry that takes place in the afternoon. And Rarely a Sunday goes by, but what several ladies in Clackamas County Jail trust Christ as their personal Savior. And then in the children's church services and adult services and Spanish services and multi-site services, we're seeing many people come to faith in Christ every single week. That's our goal. But there's also a rhythm to this. By a rhythm, it's, there's always an ebb and a flow. If you've lived long enough, you realize there's an ebb and a flow in life. You'll see that in your relationships. Uh, fellows, there'll be t that time where you think, boy, my wife just loves me to death. And then there's those times where I think she likes me. You know, it's like, uh, 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 uh. You live long enough, you'll experience those things. And you have those ebb and flow. You have that in your relationships. There's times you and your best friend see eye to eye. And then there's times that you and your best friend, you know, there's, you're still best friends. You, you just don't, something's happened. It's just not the same. But you're going to find that that's the ebb and flow of life. You'll see that. If you've raised children, there's times that you're so close to your kids. And then there's times like they look at you like, which planet did you come from? And... Uh, and you look at them sometimes like, which planet can I send you to? And uh, so there's just that ebb and flow in relationships and life. There's times you, you, you get that new job and you just come back. How do you like your job? Oh, I love it. I love it. Oh, it's just the greatest job. And then uh, you ask them several years later, how do you like your job? Oh, it's a job. Then you ask them a few years later, oh, I love it. It's going great. I just got a promotion. Things are going good. And, and there's just that ebb and flow. You are going to find in life very few things remain static. Remain static. It's, it's in a constant 
change, a constant change. And so it is in ministry. And what happens is pastors particularly are, are prone uh, to be depressed when those changes take place. Now, I have been so blessed of the Lord, I could probably count on these fingers the times I've been discouraged. Never been depressed that I know of, but probably maybe three times in 31 years where I've gone through some things and just was discouraged. But the average pastor that I seem to spend time with and talk to seems to live there. And if I said something like, I've been discouraged maybe three times in my ministry, they'd look at me like, what planet are you from? And I'm not saying that there weren't times I say, oh, I wish that day was better or I wish that sermon was better. Now that I could say a lot of times. But times where I'd get discouraged about something. But I find that a lot of pastors in ministry go through that cycle of discouragement on a regular basis. They make a joke of it, almost like, are you quitting on Monday? I've never had that feeling. I don't know what that's like. But I talk, I talk with pastors who go through that. I've talked with businessmen who love their business, hate their business. They love it, and then they hate it, and then they love it, and then they, it's just a, a constant state of emotions. There's the highs, the lows, the, all of those things. And so I'm going to speak on this message that I, I, I came up with years ago to help some pastors. I, I hope it'll be a help to you. I could have just preached it and said, you know, I've never preached this before, but I, uh, because you've never heard it before. But I want you to know the context of which God gave it to me many years ago. And I just felt, for whatever reason, this would be a good night to be able to share this truth. The Bible says in Proverbs 24, verse 16, For a just man falleth seven times and riseth up again, but the wicked shall fall into mischief. And of course I'm using the first part of that verse, For a just man falleth seven times and riseth up again. And I want to speak on the subject, three strikes and you're not out. Three strikes and you're not out. Let's bow our heads for a prayer. Father, speak to our hearts from your word. Give us a truth that's practical, that be helpful, encouragement to individuals. Lord, I know I came up with this message years ago for pastors, but I just believe there's laymen, there's people in ministry, there's people who love you, and this would be a help to them. Lord, use it for your glory and for the help of these good people, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. We all know in, in uh, softball or baseball, it's three strikes and you're out. I remember, um, of course, we have a softball league and uh, we, would we would pitch it. And if you hit the mat, uh, that's a strike. If you swing at it, that's a strike. So you can get a strike whether you swing at it or not, just like baseball. If it goes across the plate, that's a strike. If you swing and miss, that's a strike. If you hit it and it goes out of bound, that's a foul, and you can keep fouling. But in softball that we play, you can't just keep doing that. But you know, in the Christian life, you can strike, 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 and strike, and swing, and swing, and swing, and never strike out. Never strike out. You see, God uh, cares about us. We can fall down and fall down and fall down and fall down and fall down. A just man falleth seven times and riseth up again. That word seven times, that's not meant to say God's counting one, two, three. Now you got four more, you know, and the seven, you're out. No, no, it's not that. That seven is a number of completion. In other words, what it means is uh, God saying, you can keep falling, but I'll keep picking you up. You can keep falling, but I'll keep picking you up. And you're going to find in ministry, you're going to find times like that where you get discouraged. And many times people in ministry or people uh, uh, serving God, maybe on a bus route, maybe you're a bus captain, maybe you're a bus worker, maybe you're a bus driver, maybe you're a Sunday school teacher and your classes got a little smaller. Maybe you're uh, a bus captain. I was talking to one uh, 
during greeting time. How'd your route go today? Oh, it was a terrible day. It was Mother's Day. I guess all the kids went to being with mom, so not a lot of kids on the bus. That's okay. Things like that happen. There's that ebb and flow in ministry all the time. Three strikes and you're not out. I'm going to share with you three ideas. First of all, the strike of numerical setbacks. The strike of numerical setbacks. If you think about this as a pastor, one of the most disheartening things for a pastor is when his church is growing and growing and growing and reaches a certain state, and then all of a sudden, something happens. The Bible says in John 6, 66, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Can you imagine how discouraging that could have been to our Savior had he not known that was a part of the plan? Could you imagine all these people following him? John chapter 6, he feeds the 5,000 men plus women plus children, 20,000 people. He feeds them. They're all following. He, had, he sent out disciples by the 70s, and now he teaches them truth. And many of them say, this is a hard saying. Who can bear it? And from that time, many of his disciples walked back and went no more with him. He turns to the 12 and says, will you also go? Imagine being the creator of the ends of the earth, the Savior, the Messiah, the Anointed One, uh, the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy, and yet your disciples leave. Oh, that's discouraging, isn't it? Imagine, and Jesus is knowing the cross is awaiting ahead of him. Maybe, maybe if he had human thoughts, he'd say, hey, I'm having second thoughts about this. Is this the crowd I'm dying for? Is this the crowd I'm going to the cross for? The ones that are going to leave me? He turns to the twelve, will ye also go? Peter, the spokesman, says, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of life, uh, eternal life, and we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen. Setbacks. Setbacks can take away years of advancement in a very short span of time. Uh, you know, if you've been around church work a long time, you know that growth is hard and slow and hard and slow. You, you get two families, you, you, le you lose one. You get one, you lose one. You get two, you lose one. You get three, you lose two. Hey, we're living in a mobile society. And, and not only that, we still lose uh, people, members, for all the same reasons, you know. Uh, how many think uh, in this age a Christian could still get backslidden? Anybody think that could happen? Oh, yeah, I think that could happen, huh? That can happen when we sit in a pew, but it really happens when we leave the pew and don't come and sit in it anymore. And we just, you know, go our own way, get backslidden, drift from God for a while, and then God gets our attention. And usually we're too prideful to go back to that church we left, so we got to go find another one, get a fresh start, and then we get backslidden and leave that church, and then we're out of will of God for a while, and then we have to go back. Ah, oh, you know the, the picture there. The strike of numerical setbacks. It's discouraging. Many years of advancement. A church can split. And greatly reduce your church's attendance. I grew up in the Bible Belt. They had a wonderful program for starting churches. It was called Church Splits. <laughs> oh, yeah, it was a wonderful program. There's a reason in the South there's a church on every corner. There's a reason. You have First Baptist Church, Second Baptist Church, Third Baptist Church, Fourth, Fifth, Sixth, Seventh, Eighth. Not quite, but you, you get the picture. And... Uh, and uh, want to break off, First Baptist to break off from Second Baptist. And Second Baptist, uh, by the way, usually First and Second was always a split. You have a First Baptist, you have a Second Baptist. But that no one wanted to be called Third Baptist, so they're, they're called Faith Baptists. They have more faith than the other guys. Or Grace Baptists, they had more grace than the other guys. Or Truth Baptist. And you know, the name goes on and on and on. A church split can greatly reduce your church's attendance. I remember I went off to Bible college from the small church that I attended, which ran about 70 on a high day, would have maybe 100. And I went off to Bible college, and while I was off to Bible college, lo and behold, my church had a church split. Uh, uh, some people came along that didn't agree with what our church always had done, and they voted out my pastor. And my father, of course, was loyal to my pastor, but my pastor went off, passed it some other place, so my parents didn't have a place to go to church. And so they 
joined somebody else who wanted to start a church, and they started a church in the basement of a barber shop. Boy, that was like having church. And so I come home from Bible, church, Bible college, and I'm going into the basement of a barber shop, and we're having church, and two people are trying to sing that have no, no reason to sing. <laughs> oh, they were blessing us out. It was terrible. It was terrible. And of course, I'm from Bible college. I'm used to the Bible college choir and the singing and the music and all that stuff. I get back, and it's... Uh, what a day, glorious day that will be. And I'm thinking, oh, Lord, it will be when we get out of here. And, uh, and the guy was preaching, and, and he must have been a good man, but I didn't know him. He wasn't my pastor. And we had a good church, and we helped build that building, and it was a wonderful place to meet. And uh, that's where I got saved and all those things. And I came back, and here's 20 people in the basement of a barber shop, and I'm looking and saying, do you remember those days, honey? Wasn't that pitiful? It was, it was so pitiful. And we're just smiling and grinning and happy for everybody and happy we go home that afternoon. A church split. It greatly reduces your church's attendance. Economic depressed area. I, I've known churches, for instance, where we're in military towns, and then everybody has deployed, everyone gets deployed, or they shut down the base, or, or, or things happen, and every time they, they have new orders, they're losing families. It's a traumatic thing. Uh, I, I know up in Seattle when, you know, Boeing has a hard time, boy, that affects a lot of churches, doesn't it? And you get all these different things that are happening. Economics plays a big role, and, and it can hurt your church very much. Negative press, negative press. Man, you hear about great churches. One, one of the largest churches in Seattle, you know, the pastor got a little mad or something and, and, uh, and uh, resigned the church, and uh, maybe he was asked to resign, but it was a mutual thing. He resigned, and... And guess what? About a year later, there is no such thing as that church. How does a church run 12 to 14,000 and a year later, there's no church? I've known of churches that would run five or 6,000 and then maybe have an immoral situation on a staff member, a staff is setting and something, and then all of a sudden it's running several hundred. Let me just say, when you're running 5,000, you're running several hundred, those several hundred people can't still pay the bills. But that's what happens. That's why, that's why you pray for your pastor so things like that never do happen. See, you trip up and, and we miss you. I trip up, it affects this church. I can't afford to do that. And that's why i got to have your prayer. I, somebody asked me a few weeks ago how I was doing. I said, great. And then it dawned on me. I, I had had, that day, about a dozen people came up and said, Pastor, I pray for you every day. Pastor, I pray for you every day. And then it dawned on me, well, no wonder I'm feeling great. i got so many people praying for me. I'm always feeling great because people pray for me. And by the way, thank you. I need that. I need that. So there's all these different things that can happen. We've had some of those things happen. When we were four years old, on our four-year anniversary, we had 395 back in the Carpenter's Hall. Four years old, 395. I came here and didn't know a single soul. Four years later, we had 395. Wow! What a blessing that was. That same year, though, shortly after that, we had just pulled out of a denomination. I was in a Baptist denomination while I was uh, on vacation after that four-year anniversary. I went on a vacation, took my family to Disneyland. Uh, during that time, one of our members died. It cost me $700 myself to fly back, do the funeral, fly back, pick up my family, come back. But when I flew back for the funeral, one of our deacons said, Pastor, we got problems. Actually, we didn't have deacons at that time, but Merle White told me, Pastor, we got problems. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, the nomination is meeting with some of our men, and they're trying, what do you mean they're meeting with some of our men? The headquarters of the nominations in Nashville. What do you mean they're meeting with? Well, they're on the phone. They're having conferences on the phone. They're trying to get you to be more denominational. More denominational? 
Good night. What do they want me to be? I, I was the, you know, the, the vice, uh, the assistant moderator of the Northwest Association in that denomination. I, I just spoke to the National Association earlier that year to 6,000 people. I mean, when you're, when you're a guest speaker at the National Association, you think, well, you, that's pretty denominational, I guess, you know. I said, what do you mean? And they said, well, it's about control. They want, they want to have control over it. I said, nobody has control over me except God. Well, they're trying to get the men to try to force you to do I said, what? You see, that's interference into a local church. A church is an autonomous thing. And no outside force should ever have any force on a local New Testament church. That church decides its future. That church decides its destiny. No outside force. And so uh, I, I decided I needed to do something. I called up my good friend, Dr. Jack Treber, and said, Doc, I've got some problems. What can I do? He gave me some advice. And that Sunday night, I stood up and preached the message, let's make a decision. I already had. Uh, I was leaving a denomination that wanted to exert uh, control over a New Testament or a, an autonomous church. I can't do that. I said, that's unscriptural. And so we took a vote, about 85% of the people that were there, about 100 people there, 85. I, and I said, if you're with me, come and stand on the stage. It was pretty dramatic. I, I was in a mood. And, uh, <laughs> Dr. Howes used to say, there ought to be times that you show everyone you have a bomb and some days open the closet and just say, it's there, you know. But I pulled it out that night. And I just, I just told them the kind of church we're going to be. And we're not going to be the kind of church that's dictated by an outside force. That's what we're not going to be. We're going to be a soul winning church. We're going to be a Bible believing church. We're going to be a loving church. We're going to be a caring church. And we don't have to have someone from Nashville to tell us that. Anyway. Uh, by the way, there are more than one uh, Denominations have headquarters in Nashville, so it's a, there's a lot of them. I think there was 22 Bible colleges in Nashville when I attended, and many, many associations. So uh, we had 395, and then we pulled away from the denomination, and then about six weeks later, an unusual thing happened. Everyone in our phone directory got a lawsuit, a lawsuit. You see, that denomination sued us for everything we own. But they didn't sue us as far as the church. They sued us all as individuals. They took every family we had in our church family directory. And you, some people say, where's the directory? There's a reason I don't like those things. <laughs> Be because they sued every family in our directory. Some people at 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night, knock on the door, and someone from the court say, here's a lawsuit. Imagine. Their name's in it. They're being sued personally because they're a member of Grandview Baptist Church. Wow. You talk about depressing. We went from an attendance of 250 strong, strong church. We just bought our property. We were paying for a new building. We dug the foundation. We were paying for it in cash. We didn't have all the cash, but that was our plan to pay for it in cash. And we had people who had the funds to do it. Four years old. God blessed. When local bank presidents was ours. Some of the biz leading businessmen were ours. Some of the doctors were ours. Uh, some of the uh, leading people in Oregon City belonged to our church. Even though we met in a carpenter's hall, God was blessing. But we went from 250 solid to 80 in less than one month. And by the way, it wasn't that they didn't love us. They just didn't want to be a part of a lawsuit. They didn't know who was right. They didn't know if they were right, pastor was right. They didn't know who was right. I understand that. I didn't want to be a part of a lawsuit. But when you go from 280, that's disheartening. See, three times 80 is 240. We were running 250, and now we're at 80. One-third. 
It was pretty much the Sunday school teachers, the soul winners, the workers, the core group. That's who we were left with. And, you know, it was so strange because I had led most of those people to Christ myself. Most of those people. In Oregon City, I'd knocked on those doors so many times. That is a terrible setback numerically. The hardest thing to get in my mind was to have a high day, and a high day would be maybe half of our previous attendance. Let's shoot for a high day. We're at 80 now. Five years earlier to the day almost, we started with 75. Five years later, we had 80. Boy, that's something when you work for five years and you gain five. It took the wind out of our sails. The offerings were gone. The people were gone. But you know, it proved to be the best thing ever happened to our church. Because I gathered our people together and I said, you know, I'm not sure we have a future. I was just being honest with them. I'm not sure we have a future. I said, but until we die, we can keep everyone we can out of hell. Let's go share the gospel. Let's just forget about building a church and let's just go share the gospel. Let's grab any track we have and, uh, and let's go tell people about Jesus. And that's what we did. And the first six months, it was all we could do to keep our head out of the water, you know, keep our head afloat. The, the second six months, God started blessing. The third six months, we had momentum again. The thing was growing and God was blessing and it was exciting and the bigger days were all ahead. The Lord just kept blessing and blessing and blessing. By the way, on our four year, our four year anniversary, we had 395. On our five year anniversary, we had 469. Oh yeah. We had about uh, uh, 350 guests that day. Uh, so our core group was still only about 100, but we had a big day, and we worked hard, and we got a lot of people there, had a lot of people saved, and uh, we call that Black Sunday. I got up to preach, and there wasn't any of our members in the, in the uh, carpenter's hall. It was all visitors. I didn't have any ushers. I didn't have a special. I didn't have, it was just me, and uh, it was awkward, but God blessed anyway, and we just kept going forward. What I'm saying is you can have a strike of numerical numbers. You can have a church get hit over and over and over and over. But if they'll just keep going, if they'll just keep going, if they'll just keep going, God will bless again. God will bless again. God will bless again. And those numbers will start coming again because you'll reach somebody who gets excited about your church. You know... When we were going through that lawsuit and all those difficult days, we were adding families every single week and they never knew we had a lawsuit against us because we never talked about it. We just never talked about it. We gave away everything we owned, about 130000 We gave it all away and we sang, uh, it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. And then we sang, I'm happy in the Lord anyway. Those things did not matter. Reaching people for Jesus, that's what mattered. Now, you may have a business and you're having numerical setbacks. You may look at your budget and you're having numerical setbacks. You, you may look at uh, things in, in your ministry or your bus route or your church or, or your ministry that you preach at or teach at or whatever, and, and, and things aren't going in a positive direction. Don't quit. Don't quit. A just man falleth down seven times and riseth up again. Your hope is in Christ, not in people. Not in people. He'll never fail you. Just keep going. Just keep going. Just keep going. Just keep going. Put a, put a smile on when it's hurting you the most and just keep on going. Keep on going. The strike of numerical setbacks, that, that has a tremendous negative blow uh, to many pastors and people in ministry. 
Secondly, the strike of financial setbacks. You know, the finances, you, you got to have that to operate. Acts 3, 6 says, Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. You know, Peter and James were good Baptists. They said, Silver and gold have I none. Good poor Baptists. I guess that's what they were. I don't know. They were Christians without cash. You've been there before, huh? I've been there before. And you know, uh, that, that for a pastor, that's, that's like the fuel in the engine. The finances is like gas in the automobile. It, it's what allows us as a church to get something done for Christ. You say, well, why do we need that cash? Well, to pay the light bills, to pay the mortgage, to pay the outreach, to pay the staff, to pay the uh, missionaries. All the ministries of a church, it's run by cash. Many years ago, I heard a pastor at Riverview, Dr. Dallas Dobson. He's been in heaven now for 30 years, I guess, and uh, uh, 20 years at least. He said, uh, money is ministry. Money is ministry. I never heard that before. I used to be so afraid to talk about money. And he said, money is ministry. I remember telling uh, Dr. Jack Treber one time, I said, Brother Treber, if I talked, about, I talked about money as much as you did, I'd lose people. He said, I hope so. I said, what? He said, Brother Mutchler, you got to decide who are you going to build your church on. I want to build my church on honest people. He said, if they'll steal from God, you think you can trust them? I don't know about you, but that made sense to me. Because it seemed like the guy who complained if I preached on money didn't give anyway. So if you lose a person who's not going to give anyway to the work of God, what have you lost? The truth is, all of us ought to be givers. That's a biblical precept. That's a biblical command. God tells us to bring our tithes and offerings into the house of God. We've got to do that. The lack of financial finances produces pressure all of its own and can literally take away the tools for growth. Many people leaving at one time, a church split, that causes financial problems. Many people laid off from work can cause that. The loss of some good uh, givers can cause that. A trying times that a church goes through uh, can affect it financially as well. Uh, I remember when we had that, that say, split. Actually, they didn't, we didn't split. It just we had people leave. We had a lawsuit. And we went from 250 strong to 80. Our biggest givers were gone. And we lost over 1,000 a week in just offerings just, just like that. And back then, uh, that was a whole lot to us. Uh, I had to go out and borrow personally $10,000 to keep paying the rent on the building that we met in. I had to work an odd job to try to feed my family. Church couldn't afford to pay me. that we, we didn't have funds. Those were tough times. I remember times in the life of our church when we couldn't afford to buy gospel tracts. We would uh, go to a door and we'd say, uh, we had one track in our hand. we say, hello, I'm from Grandview Baptist Church. I'd like to show you something. And they'd reach out to get it and say, no. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, we can't give these out at this time. It's the only one I have. When we go through the gospel plan, we'd almost laminate them because they're the only things we had. We couldn't afford to print gospel tracts. Now, that's pretty desperate for a church. But that's the way we were. We didn't have the funds. We didn't have the money. And so we would show them. And then there came a time where we actually gave out our last ones. And we'd have to say, if I had a track, I'd show you. But since I memorized it, let me tell you about it. And we would just have to share the gospel. We had nothing to hand someone if we knocked on a door, if we engaged someone in conversation. We didn't have a gospel track to hand to anyone because we just could not afford it. Uh, there's been times in our church, I remember back in 2001, you had uh, 
of Black Monday and you had the setback of the uh, market and the tech stocks and people lost a ton of money. And then 2003, people lost a lot of money. And we had our biggest givers were hit so hard during that time. And from one year, we had a year where in one month's time, our church lost, lost $30,000 in givers. And by the way, we didn't lose the people. It's just our business went down. We had three people in our church that their combined income gifts to the church was $450,000 a year. Do you know how many families it takes to make that up? I'll just tell you, a whole bunch. A whole bunch. Just imagine what you give per year and then think how many families would it take to make that up. It takes a whole lot, even those who give a lot. So pastors go through that and they have a recession. I talk to a lot of pastors. They're having to go get a second job. They have to go do this, do that. I never minded that. In my ministry, at least three or four different times, I've got a job. In the last, if I've been a pastor for 40 years. Never has bothered me. I never worry about my salary. I worry about the other 51 people on staff here at Grandview Baptist Church. It's hard to believe with our church and our school that 51 people get a salary from Grandview Baptist Church. Now, folks, that's a lot of people. And so if I stay awake at night for finance, it's, it's not to pay my salary, it's to pay theirs. You know, I wonder how we'll put the gas in the buses. I wonder how we'll have the buses run for the uh, children and the families. I, I wonder how we'll keep the lights on. I wonder how we'll do all these things. Now, God's never failed us, never. And I'm getting to the place that doesn't bother me much because I'm, I'm growing in faith. It's taken a long time, but I'm growing in faith. I'm trusting the Lord. And I'm going to meet on Monday and Tuesday, and I'm going to trust the Lord again that God's people will come and God will have an answer. But you know, that's a big setback. And I find pastors all the time, they get discouraged because of finances, and many even get out of the ministry. They have numerical setbacks. They have financial setbacks. And then lastly, and here's the hardest thing I believe that tackles churches today. The strike of complacency. The strike of complacency. You know, it's interesting. You can have numerical setbacks and a pastor just keep on going forward. You can have financial setbacks and a pastor just keep on going forward, trusting God each and every day. But what happens is God blesses the church, and because God blesses the church, the pastor and the people get complacent. Complacent. Folks, we ought to always be hungry to accomplish something for God. Always be hungry to accomplish something for God. Always pushing. Always reaching. It's not about a size, it's about a mission. And the mission is to reach people for Jesus. And that mission will never go away till Jesus comes. But what happens is to the average church, it gets large enough to pay the pastor's salary, to pay for the programs, to pay for a few missions, missionaries, and so they sit there and never grow anymore. And that's why the average church in America is just about 100. Because at that size they can pay the bills. And they lose their zeal for souls. I've told our staff over and over again, that's not happening here. That's not happening here. We're not here to reach a certain size. We're here to reach this area for Christ. And we're going to keep, keep at it and keep at it and keep at it till Jesus comes. 
But the strike of complacency, the church has a nice building, the pastor and staff are taken care of, the church is organized, it's prospering. Interesting enough, the things we long for can bring our biggest setbacks. We want land, you get it. You want buildings, you get it. You want programs, you get it. You want people, you get it. And now, because you have it, you get complacent. Amos chapter 6 verse 1 says, Woe to them that are at ease in Zion and trust in the mountain of Samaria, which are named chief of the nations to whom the house of Israel came. And when I preached this message about 12, 13, 14 years ago to a bunch of pastors, I sympathized them when, when I talked about setbacks. I said, been there, done that. I sympathized with them when I talked about financial setbacks. Been there, done that. Keep being there, done that. Keep, that's just rotational. Always doing that. But when it came to complacency, now I didn't commiserate with them. I read back and preached to them. It's time for you to get off your duff and go do something for Jesus. It's time for you to get out of your, your pity party and go do something for Jesus. There's neighbors that need to be saved. There's kids that need to be saved. There's, there's, there's people that need to be reached for Jesus Christ. And there's no way we can be complacent when there's people around us that need to hear the Savior. Several years ago, one of our uh, Bible college students, uh, I, I called and see, he, he called me and was sharing with me how he was doing. And I, I was asking a question. I said, well, how's your soul winning going? He said, oh, it's great. He said, uh, uh, last, last week, he said, I, I led one to Christ. I said, well, praise the Lord. I said, now, you work on a bus route? He said, yeah, yeah. I said, now, uh, you led one to Christ, right? Yeah, okay, that's good. I said, now, uh, how about this week? Do you get No, no. How about the week before that? Do you get No, no. No, I, I've led one in the last three or four weeks to Christ. I said, oh. And I said, well, you know, that's, that's not bad. Since the church is way out in the country... And there's hardly any people around there. And he said, Pastor, no, no, the church is in Santa Clara. It's Golden State Baptist College. I said, there's 7 million people in this valley. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I said, well, uh, well, I know that's an affluent area. And so it must be very difficult to lead the millionaires to Christ. Because they're all rich, right? They're all rich. It's, it's Silicon Valley. They're all rich there, right? And they said, oh, no, no, there's, there's, there's poor people all over. Oh, oh. I said, well, they, they, must, they, must all, they must all be senior citizens. You know, I know how hard it is. Statistically, when you get above 70, it's awfully hard to lead people to Christ because statistically children get saved, but as you get older, it gets more statistically harder to lead people. He said, Pastor, he said, there's kids everywhere. I said, then why have you only led one to Christ? If there's poor people around and there's children around and there's plenty of people around, can't you lead more than one every three weeks to Christ? That next week, you called me back and said, Pastor, I led 10 to Christ. I said, that's more like it. I get missionary letters. Pray for us. There's 40 million people in our country. 40 million people in our country. And then they'll say, we had one saved the last three months. Well, how, many, how long is it going to take to lead 40 million to Christ when you get one saved every three months? It seems like a long time. And they always say, pray that God would send us more helpers. More helpers leading one person every three months. How many helpers would you have to have in your church to make any difference for Christ? We need to get consumed. There's a world that needs the Savior and we need to get out of complacency and get on fire for God all the time. You're going to have setbacks with attendance. You're going to have setbacks with financials. 
But you should never have a setback because your heart gets cold and indifferent to the things of God. We cannot afford to be complacent. We got to be on fire for God, on fire for God. Well, that's what I challenged some pastors many years ago. And I feel like maybe there's some bit of complacency in our hearts at times. I know my old heart. I, I have to sometimes give myself a pep talk. But I'm not going to, I'm not going to be complacent. I'm not going to be that. I want to keep going until Jesus comes. I want to keep going until Jesus comes. And uh, let's just make up our mind. That's what we're going to do. We'll work till Jesus comes. We'll work till Jesus comes. We'll work till Jesus comes and we'll be gathered home. Let's bow our heads for a prayer.